So uh, yeah, welcome. Um, I'm interested in talking about uh, some strategies uh, Native Americans use as they adapted to uh, the environment in um, um, in North America and uh, all the way from the West Coast to the East Coast, as uh, you will see as I go through this talk today. I gave a version of this back in 2014 um, in, uh, in memory of Vaughn Brown, who was a benefactor, not only of the Friends of the Tapsco Female Institute, uh, but also a lot of my archaeology work and the work of the Howard of the Upper Patuxent Archaeology Group. Uh, he was an avid, had added interest in Native Americans uh, with uh, books and, and also was impressed with their imprint that they made on uh, North America. And uh, his wife, when he died, donated a number of books. And before he died, he actually uh, gave me a, uh, a, a three-quarter grooved ax that he had found at a site up in uh, Harford County, Maryland, and um, wanted me to use that to show people. That today, I do have uh, some artifacts that I brought to share, and it's possible. I know that people are not in a straight line, or, but it's possible if uh, some of these, if you would like to see them, can be passed around if I start here and work the way back and then across and up here, and you guys could put them right back here. That would be. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to pass around the, the one full, or it's not a full grooved act, it's a three quarter grooved. Um, that would be great for cutting trees um, uh, if it was sharper. It's, it's fairly dull today. Uh, but there's several other, as you can see, um, there are a variety of different sizes and shapes depending on what they're doing with the particular artifact that they've created. And like I said, this is a, that's a, a three-quarter groove because uh, the, the groove doesn't go all the way around. It stops here. Sometimes they put a, a, was a full grooved axe. And just like present day hammers and axes, they had different applications. Yes, sir. How would they make that smooth? Uh, sand and wood over time. Many, many hours. Sand and wood. And, uh, but they had the time. You know, they didn't have, uh, you didn't have a bus in, internet and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I'll, I'll just pass around a couple. Um, this is one that a student of mine found um, near Atholton High School. I was, I happened to be, it was a garden plot for Columbia. And I think they brought in dirt from other parts of the county and their artifacts. This was found over near um, the Clark Farm. Um, a, a relatively small axe that, um, I, again, uh, I'll pass those three around if you'd like to take a look at them. Um, uh, they wouldn't be obviously used as much in, in hunting, obviously, but more for cutting down trees and also in the butchering or, or in processing, uh, breaking bones, etc. But today, the, the next few minutes, we're going to emphasize the other projectile uh, points of uh, artifacts that were used by Native Americans um, that oftentimes we call spear points and, um, and how they were hafted or attached to wooden shafts. What is this word hafted? Haft means how you attach it, how you attach a, wood, uh, a wooden a base or, or to the base of the point whether you're making a spear, um, and that's a good question, or uh, a knife. Um, they use knives, obviously present day knives are a lot different, but these were sharp, and they, were, they oftentimes were hafted or attached to a piece of wood and uh, with sinew to uh, um, attach it securely. So they had different artifacts, different knives that were used. And um, in some cases, especially with present-day archaeologists involved in experimental archaeology, where they'll attempt to make use of different tools that Native Americans use when they were butchering an animal. Uh, they use scrapers, like the two in the bottom, the side scraper and a thumb scraper, both of which we have found out at the, the Wallace site in Howard County. And more on that later. And also drills for a variety of operations. 
Um, as I said, experimental archaeologists have been involved in um, butchering animals using stone tools. And uh, I'm going to show a, a video clip. Now, there's a little blood in this because they are butchering a bison, or a, or a, 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 it's a bison, not a buffalo. But um, I'm going to move up here and <laughs> if I can... Well, they're, they're, they are different species. The bisons are generally a little uh, larger, larger head and more curved in, in their uh, spine. Um, whoops. I'm <laughs> trying to, whoops. And we'll see if this is loud enough to hear it. Uh, they, the uh, Native Americans would, would uh, try to get uh, let's say a buffalo or bison into narrow nick points or canyons, box canyons, where they could then uh, kill it and then later butcher it. And this is a little bit about how archaeologists today now again, this is humanely killed with a rifle. And they're using, now they're not, these, a lot of these knives are not hafted. They're just using a knife in their, in their hand without it being hafted to wood. Here, a group of early man archaeologists are butchering a bison using Clovis style stone knives. I don't know if you can hear it. This mic doesn't seem to do much. Anyway, you can see them using stone knives. But the butchering is being done entirely with stone knives. Luckily, you don't have to do this when you go to Safeway or Giant. You just, you just pick up what they've done. And that's some of the scapula meat that was uh, cut, removed. As we say, they can put it over a drying rack and it'll be glazed, and flies won't touch it after 30 or 40 minutes. And while stone knives slice through bison meat very effectively, that's a bison, yes. And that's a cut on Stanford's. The cut on Stanford's hand. I took my students down to meet him at Smithsonian back in the 70s. He passed away last year. Uh, but obviously, he's a, definitely was into a lot of experimental archaeology. And here they are taking sinew from the animal and using it to attach projectiles to shafts of wood. So they were able to get a lot out of the animal beside the meat. With the bison's blood is glue to bind the clovis point to the fore shaft. And there's a, a point that's attached. For a few hours early one morning before the sun grew hot. So I Pardon? Sinu dries. dries, yes. Yes. And uh, I. Uh, Pardon? Yes, it does shrink over time. Very good questions. And uh, let me get back to the. To the uh, the gentleman cutting the this particular animal and using uh, either hafted tools or projectiles, uh, blades or knives without being hafted. I haven't used the word arrowhead yet till now because a lot of people refer to anything that they look at that seems to be Indian as an arrowhead, but a true arrowhead um, would be one that attached, as you see there, to the an arrow shaft, therefore an arrowhead. Um, all, any artifact that can be hafted uh, either for a knife or a spear, or it would be called a projectile point, something that could be hafted and thrusted or thrown. Uh, true arrowheads are small enough to go in on arrow shaft. And if you've been to any stores, uh, oftentimes they, uh, people will try to sell you arrowheads these particular ones that I took pictures of, I didn't buy them, uh, were out in, the, in Colorado a few years ago. 
They're actually flakes that they make look like arrowheads, but they're really not. Um, so there is money in, uh, in people buying and selling artifacts. Um, and uh, I've been on sites on the internet where people do sell and buy uh, and spend good money um, on um, Indian lithic artifacts. Uh, but the first sentence in my book is, it's not what you find, it's what you find out about an artifact, and it's not how much it's worth. Uh, but that doesn't negate the point that there are still uh, people out there that will be interested enough to buy the artifacts. What were those flags? Pardon? What are the red flags in here? Ah, this is at a site in uh, down in... Uh, it's another talk I do in more detail about Native Americans. Those red flags are identifying artifacts that were found. And there were over, in one particular day we were at this site, we had 800 flags. And it took us two weekends to log them all in. Luckily, the site was protected. It was right on the Potomac River. It was very difficult to get to. And people didn't know about it. Because once people know about things, uh, things happen. <laughs> it's it's not what you find. It's how, it's how much it's worth. Yeah. Was it a yes. At the time it was. At the time it was purchased by the Saudis. They were going to do a big uh, not, a uh, golf complex and um, uh, facility for businesses. Yada yada. It didn't work out for them. They had some problems with uh, zoning. Um, but anyway, it's now a country club. The um, I'm trying to think of the name of it. It might come. It might come to me. But anyway, yes, when the fields are plowed, and oftentimes, um, and again, in one of my lectures on prehistoric Native Americans in Howard County, I talk a little bit more about what we found in some of the farm fields, especially when they were plowing them. <laughs> yes. But there were so many things there. It could be assumed that that was a small Indian village. Um. There were, uh, there was a, uh, there was an encampment there. I, uh, th that particular site wasn't a, a village, um, but there was a, a, a temporary. It was too fairly close to the river, flooded a lot, so uh, they were a little bit uh, further back in high ground for the the uh, uh, the village. So anyway, uh, spent a lot of time. There's four chapters of my a book on Native Americans, and that's my basic. Um, forte in, in archaeology. That's uh, how I learned it from the ground up at that site that you just asked about with, with the 800 flags with my mentor, Mac McDaniel from American University. Um, but today is July 7th. Welcome to the, uh, the dry. And I don't hear any thunder right now. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about strategies and techniques of Native Americans that are a mixture of physical as well as cognitive skills. Another Native American that I met and took my students to a site that she ran in uh, Virginia is, is uh, Shirley Little Dove Costello. Um, she was very knowledgeable, and her father uh, asked her to be the uh, education specialist at the Mattapony Reservation, and people would take, would take tours there. Uh, she was nice enough to let us spend several days there camping out and helping them um, do archaeology, et cetera, at the site. And uh, she was very knowledgeable about, um, especially about the worldview of Native Americans, versus say the, the uh, European Americans that um, um, some of her ancestors met, especially at, at, at Jamestown. And uh, we actually use those knives, uh, got from Borman's Meat Market, he gave us some uh, uh, sides of beef, the deer that people didn't want. And um, we uh, took it down there, cut them up with uh, knives, uh, put them on a, um, used, a, like I said, hafted knives to uh, cut them, start a fire, and then uh, place the uh, little strips uh, on once the fire turned into an oven and heated them up. And something else that the kids from Howard County didn't, and never knew about, uh, when I asked them, I said, do you ever have succotash? They said, what's that? I said, I said well, that's, that's what's in this, this pot right here. Uh, surely we had some... Uh, uh, some corn and lima beans, and they said, oh, that's what that is, okay. They liked it, along with the beef. 
Uh, where's the beef? It's, it was right there. And Shirley, as I said, was uh, very knowledgeable. She was hired as a consultant on the 1995 Disney film, Pocahontas. But she decided not to do it <laughs> because Pocahontas became more of a Hollywood love story between Pocahontas and John Smith, of course, the blonde guy from Europe, um, who didn't look anything like that, and also didn't ever, she, he never married uh, Pocahontas. She married John Rolfe, not John Smith. And I've taken some uh, groups from Howard County to do some archaeology in Jamestown, and of course we talked about the stories of uh, um, the, the real story of John Smith and Pocahontas, not the Hollywood vert, the love story. <laughs> But anyway, more on the hunting strategies. And these will go back to about 11 to 13,000 years ago uh, during the, uh, the, toward the end of the Ice Age um, when there was a lot of large game referred to as megafauna in the area. And interestingly enough, during the Ice Age, there was about a 500 mile wide strip of land because the uh, water, uh, water levels dropped by uh, 200 to 300 feet. So this area here is called Beringia because it was land, because there was no water. So without knowing it, individuals could, could walk right across of Siberia or Asia into North America. And that's how the peopling of America occurred. And of course, there was a lot of game early on, um, mammoth and mastodon. Their difference between the two is sort of like uh, the buffalo and, and bison. Um, the mastodon are considered to be browsers, whereas mammoths are grazers, feeding more on low-lying grasses, whereas the uh, mastodon are more on woody plants and vegetation and shrubs. And you can tell the differences in their dentition, the teeth of mastodon uh, and what they're masticating versus the flat tooth of the grazers, low-lying grasses of the uh, mammoth. Um, I don't know if Native Americans cared that much about uh, their dentition, um, but they were good. They provided meat for sure. And um, you can see the difference in the teeth here between the mastodon and the mammoth. And uh, we talk a little bit about some of the megafauna that was in North America back to 17,000 years ago, and would have been around at the time when the first Americans came across around 13 to 12,000 years ago. Now this vid clip, uh, let's see if I can, this particular vid clip uh, deals with a cave Clovis man Whoops. lived and hunted by. And this particular cave, uh, I got to get to the right spot here. This cave, the depth from the top of the surface to the bottom of the cave is 85 feet. Uh, animals, without knowing it, that first step was a terrible step. <laughs> And but archaeologists were able to find what kind of game was in North America even before humans came over. Every year, groups of volunteers now that this is going to be here during the summer hunting for the remains of Ice Age animals. So the archaeologists are using trowels to, to excavate. These are the leg bones of a lion that died 20,000 years That's ago. That's a lion. Most of the bones of the long extinct animals are smaller and found by sifting the excavated material. So they need to have a good idea of the anatomy of, of uh, different animals. The animals themselves died by falling to the floor There's of the, the top cave of the cave from the opening, 85 feet above. And Miles Cavendish was in the excavation talk about Gilbert of the University of Missouri. This cave contains the bones of the kinds of animals which would have been available to the earliest people to, who came into the New World. This is, uh, represents a smorgasbord of the kinds of animals which would have been available to, to feed the earliest occupants. You see the 
the entrance to this cave is is now even now well you can see the, the, the top the of it present day we would have had at least 10,000 years ago at that time there, there would have been, been some kind of vegetation around it. and vegetation around the cave entrance and it's it's quite easy to imagine a herd of bison or bighorn sheep running in nice the cave big horn sheep animals such as a giant lion or a cheetah and Lion and cheetah were in North America in this area 17,000 years ago. Zebra. Animals that you would find in the Serengeti Plain today in a grassland environment. Bighorn sheep, zebras, two or three kinds of horses. Zebra, bighorn sheep, camels, horses. Not only these herbivores, but also their predators, such as an extinct form of bear, a very long legged running bear. And we have a bear. of that bear here in this well right here. So basically, they've they've found uh, a lots of the remains of animals that were in the area um, that would have been provided food for the Native Americans. And uh, pardon me. Oh, and in Wyoming, Wyoming border, Wyoming Montana border. Um, and like I said, the uh, lion, bear, saber-toothed tiger, um, zebra, were just some of the animals that were available. Now, in order to kill those animals, uh, that's the important point for the Native Americans and their skills or strategies of how to get a spear into that animal and um, without the animal turning on you. And... Um, We'll talk a little bit about the projectiles that were made and the quality of stone that was necessary in order to create these really um, sharp spear points that would impregnate the uh, uh, or penetrate the, the uh, fur or the hide of the uh, of the of the game and um, and also how to work that stone. Now I did bring today. Uh, and I'll pass around this box that has some of the really good quality stones, some of which I've brought back from Colorado, and some of it, um, a friend of mine, an archaeologist from uh, Virginia, uh, brought back some of the chert. Uh, that is, there's white on the outside, the cortex of the stone, oftentimes the outer surface, but inside the chert is, is a dark, usually black to gray. I have pieces of chert in here. A uh, piece of jasper, which is a real good quality stone, and also you'll, some pieces of uh, obsidian, which is really good quality stone. And um, um, so, if they were able to find quarries of this really good quality stone, then they could make artifacts that are going to be sharp enough to do the job and also hold the edge. Um, and this is a piece of brown, uh, black banded obsidian. Uh, th none of these are, are, are tools; they're flakes that could be worked. Um, but I, I'll pass them around if you care to take a look at them and work them around, work them around the room. <laughs> um, so, so anyway, the uh, once the tool was made, and then it'd be attached uh, to a to a shaft, and the the the, the iconic artifact referred to as a fluted point. Uh, referred to, some people call it a Clovis point because the first one was found in Clovis, New Mexico. Uh, the Indians were, would be able to create on, uh, a, a flute, a channel that went up the base of the flake on both sides so that it would fit into the wood and attach with the sinew and would be uh, almost like present day glue to hold that in. And to, in order to create the flute, there's a lot of pre-work that has to be done on flakes taken off of that core of stone in order to create, because uh, the last two steps is the flute, and you turn it over and do the other one. So if you mess up, you got to start all over again. So the, the ability to make these great points, and I'm sure some were better than others, some of the, the men were working the stone. And I say men, I would take kids, ladies, and guys to work stone, and I have a stone tool kit that um, I'll talk a little bit more about later, but most likely during Indian, their culture, the men were the, they worked the stone. Um, it was a, uh, a gender dominated by uh, a gender 
activity for sure, male gender. <laughs> but anyway, so there was a system involved in creating and going after the big game hunting uh, from getting the good quality stone, making sure it's uh, sharp and attaching it, and then being able to use it. And these, uh, the Clovis was found in Clovis, like I said, New Mexico, um, dated to about 13,000 years ago. And, um, uh, what is that word way up there in Alaska? Uh, I think that's Nanana, Nanana, and I'm not, these are sites where prehistoric artifacts have been found. Um, and I'm not sure, I don't know much about that site. <laughs> What's Glenarna? I'm sorry? Glenarna in our area. Ah, I'll get to the, I'm going to get to the, I'm going to get to the East Coast for sure. The Metacroft in Pennsylvania and some other ones in uh, Virginia. Um, in a few minutes, because <laughs> um, I did say we were going from head smashed in to Delmarva, so definitely going to get to to us. But uh, a little bit about the uh, these projectiles and how they were made uh, with really good quality, what's called cryptocrystalline stone had less crystals, less uh, impurities in it um, than some other stones that still could be made into tools. Uh, but we're looking for quality here and. These cryptocrystallins are definitely great for penetrating the, uh, uh, the hide of the, the animals during the Pleistocene. So teamwork, whether you try to get them running into a box canyon and attack it, or whether you're chasing it out in open land, um, which is more dangerous for the chaser. And uh, this is some of the saber-toothed tiger. We're also, they were predators of, of, of the, um, of the uh, mastodon and woolly mammoth. So uh, humans had to be careful of them as well. And working stone, uh, flint napping, is another term for it, how to, working stone, how to, to uh, drive flakes off of it to create finished projectile points. And I have a, uh, a video clip to show you a little bit about uh, the early days of uh, Bruce Bradley, who is a noted archaeologist and flint napper. Um, and I'm going to jump ahead to four. Working stone. The weapons Clovis man and his oh. defendant used in the confrontation were made from hard stone like church. Now I have a better one with better quality coming up later, but this is a, these weapons call for I show this because this is when uh, Bruce Bradley was a lot younger. Bruce Bradley is one of a small number of modern stone workers. And he's going to take a piece of stone with a hammer stone, peoples. and he's going to work it down. And she's going to take a flake you know, off of it. the Americans best through their ability to fashion stone. And make a projectile out of it. and tools they made, lost or cast aside by the owners. good quality stone, as you can see, those flakes that are coming off. The archaeologists to find. Come off nice and thin. You can work the stone. It doesn't break down. With time and place. The basic manufacturing techniques and he's creating a platform that he's going to strike to drive that flake off. The edge that won't crush or crumble when struck. And flakes come off clean. And there's the flake. Now again, you could pick that flake up and cut and beef. With a hammer and the, the strips that I was telling you about. Deer strips. But you have to be careful it doesn't cut your hand. That's why it's nice to have them. And he's working now. He has an antler baton. That also drives flakes off. That is Jasper. That's some of the stuff in the box that's going around. I'm sorry? Yeah, what's in his left hand is the, uh, that's Jasper. He's taking flakes off of it.
The one he's using as a tool is a baton, an antler baton. And I'm going to pass one around. Pardon me? Antler. Yeah, like deer antler. Yeah. Moose, deer, elk. Yeah. Very good question. And then for once it's thin enough, you can then use all other part of the antler, um, the um, rather than the uh, antler baton, it's a smaller piece of the antler, the antler tine to pressure flakes off of the artifact. So. I'll get back to, uh, and I'll show you uh, some of the uh, material we're talking about here. The, whoops, there it goes. Uh, I have a stone toolkit. I'll pass part of it around. In fact, what I think I'll do is take a few things out, and then I'll, I'll pass the whole bag around. You can take a look and work it around again. Um, this is mine. I got Sunny Surplus when they were around. To, to, the Native Americans would have a leather bag to put their, their stone toolkit. This is a deer antler. One of my students had, uh, said he was going hunting. Hunting. I was at Appleton one year. And I said, he said, yeah, I got a big buck. I said, could I have the, did you get rid of the antler? No, nah, it's still in my garage. I said, well, can I have the antler? So this is my deer antler baton. Um, but there's different ones you could have. Um, Mike Johnson, a friend of mine, has a moose antler, this is an elk antler, and then deer. He has, of course, he doesn't carry them all the time, but he has different ones that he uses on different type of stone. So I figured, uh, and then this is the antler tine that would be used to pressure flakes off. Um, and in this toolkit, what I'll do is pass it around on this. We have a, there's a, a stone, this would be called a hammer stone. And then of course you have the antler. Uh, and if you're interested in taking a look at them, feel free. And um, um, I'll even put a piece of, of, uh, of a chert. This is from out west, a gray chert that uh, could be uh, used to, to any of these tools to work it, uh, thin it down and create an artifact out of it. Um, so that's part of the toolkit the Native Americans would have, and I'll give you more detail on uh, how to use them later. Um, but uh, two types of flaking, percussion, just like a drum when you're using the hammerstone or the antler baton, uh, and then the, uh, when it's uh, pressure flaking uh, for sharpening, because obviously if they use these uh, spears enough, they're gonna get dull, so then they would pressure flake it to create their, their sharpener. They would sharpen them with a uh, antler tine. So basically, if you're starting with a piece of stone and you want to get down to the finished product, you're slowly working it down thinner and thinner. It's called core reduction. And um, they were good at it. And um, these are two. This is a beautiful set. I'm going to pass these around. Um, I have to be careful with the one set. My son-in-law, Jay Ryan, has a, uh, he used to have a buffalo in his field. Um, and we used to get her, her name was uh, Cindy. So she would shed each year and I got some of her. Yes, he actually had a buffalo, not a deer, not a uh, bison. Because they, they were imp imported. But, pardon? At his, at his farm. Wait, that if you go by his farm, that, that field, right? They used to be out there, but she's gone now. Yeah, yeah, right on 99. Yeah. They live in Maryland. Uh, good old Maryland. But I want to show you that a projectile point, and this was found at the Wallace site. Um, this was classic because this came in first. And I said, oh gosh, I hope we find the, the mate to it. And about 20 feet away at another square, a year later, two years later, this comes into the lab. And my students referred to it as, as an oh shoot point because he was probably working on it and it broke him and ah oh, shoot. But anyway, <laughs> they were found uh, apart. But this is a quartzite 
And as you can see the short base, it was probably a knife for a skilling fish, because uh, it uh, wouldn't be do much, it wouldn't be much for major work because it's, it has a fairly short shaft. But this particular stone that was made from a core stone like this. This is another one that could have been an O shoot point because we found this a few feet apart. Uh, somebody was working a core of stone, thinning it down. This one side, when you take a look at it, is completely devoid of the cortex, the outer surface. And I think when he turned it over and started working the other side, he made a mishit and it broke. So he chucked it, left it for the archeologists later. <laughs> so this, pardon? That was thoughtful. Yeah, and one is, was number 550 and this is uh, 809. So uh, uh, we have the provenience of these at the site, but I figured I'd pass them around. And um, when the, uh, uh, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna put them in this bag, and if you care to take a look, feel free. Uh, nice, uh, it was nice that uh, we were able to, to find both of those, and uh, so they were working stone at, 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 at when I get to the Wallace site. Mike Johnson, who's a Fairfax County archaeologist, would come out, and he was a very good flint knapper as well. He worked with my students sh uh, showing them how to uh, work stone, and he also made a uh, nice uh, Included uh, projectile for me. Uh, so again, fluted points as different sizes, different lengths, different thicknesses. Um, and yes, depends on the size of the game versus the skill of the maker. And uh, whether they get them into box canyons or whatever, how you go after. And I'm sure it would take, if they just get a spear or two into a large animal like that, it's gonna take, even if they get the, if they get a key organ, it's gonna, it could take them days to actually follow them until they were able to um, finish the, the uh, act when it would. Um. So another invention that was made in North America, somebody figured out a better way of, of making it safer going after these large game and created this called an atlatl. And an atlatl, instead of just taking a spear and throwing it, the atlatl, you could put a spear in it and throw it with that. And believe it or not, as you'll see in a video, it increased the force from hand versus atlatl 200, 200 times the force. So if you can create a spear and launch it with an atlatl, uh, and they also would use hammer stones, I'm sorry, not hammer stones, <laughs> banner stones, that give it a little more weight that they could place on the shaft and, uh, and then go up and they could have, again, if they had two or three going after one animal, they could get quickly, each of them, get a spear in, and then they could reload and go after it again. Um, and there are different types of atlatls and banner stones. Some are attached like this. Others, ground, I talked to you about grinding the, the axes. They would uh, grind holes through stone oh, wow. with sand and a bone or wooden dowel. Oh, that's hours, days. I've never done one myself. Um, maybe I'll have time as I get older. <laughs> but uh, there was a, a, a couple that had some artifacts that they wanted me to look at a few years ago out in Western Howard County. And they said, we're going to come over and take a look at these artifacts. I said, wow, so very nice, interesting uh, uh, axes. And she said, we're wondering what that is. And I said, you know what that is? That's the beginning of somebody trying to make a banner stone, the beginning hole of a banner stone. Started with a piece of wood, and then once you get in enough, then you can just work it further, further, so it becomes a hole, and then it goes on the shaft. Um, classic point, or classic um, 
Native American tool um, that was discarded. They found it. These are sharp. You wouldn't think they would be so sharp. Oh yes, they, it's good quality. This is a good quality shirt, and it's uh, again. Um, sometimes when I work it, I've cut myself because I'll pick it up and I'll, it'll, I'll get a, a little flake. It, it, yeah. Oh yes, it's you have to be careful. Church. C H E R T. Yeah, just the way it church. C H E. Some people call it flint. Um, but I think the geologist would say church's a better term. Yes, sir. There's someone on here who is the flint map of community in Europe. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. You know what kind of stone they were using? No. Uh huh. <laughs> well, we'll take a look at. Um, I have a video clip of Dennis Stanford showing students how to use the atlatl. Uh, we tried some of ours out there. That it was it was not a pretty sight. <laughs> if you've never done it before, it's oh golly, including me, it's terrible. But uh, we'll, so we'll take a look at. Uh, The atlatl experiment. Let's see, we got uh very close technology pretty made by I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh yes. Yeah, the, like the side scraper I sh um I don't think I have a side scraper here, but they they would take make some and then they would rough the edge up, smooth it out. It would go in your hand like a scraper tool. So if they were working on an animal going inside to, to butcher it, uh, the the base of the stone would not cut them because they softened that edge. Um, so yes, they would use some without attaching it to a. Yeah, I would assume in their pouts they would have something that if they needed a knife uh, for cutting something, they'd pull it out and use it. So they had a little stone tool kit that they carried with them. Um, so uh, this is uh, Stanford uh, showing the students out in, uh, I think in Utah, um, uh, how the, uh, the difference between the atlatl and throwing a spear with your Spear with yeah. a throwing handle called an atlatl. Ah, this sounds better. <laughs> Sorry. This ancient device has brought Dennis Stamford of the Smithsonian Institution to Colorado Springs at the invitation of Val Veers and his physics students. Sorry, Colorado, not Utah. We have a, a tapered butt on there. That so that's the fore shaft. That. And, and that's the main it, shaft. And that's in good and solid. And when this hits an animal, these were used primarily for, for big game like bison, camel, horses, mammoths. But when it hits, then you get the uh, opposite reaction and it throws the spear back like that. And uh, if you're fast, you can run in and grab the spear, spear, reload. And you have a bag of these, put it back on, and then get another quick shot right away. The student physicists from Colorado College will compare a conventional spear to one launched with an atlatl. The target is linked to a computer. It will record the energy of each spear at impact. This tells us the velocity of your arrow. Once we got he said arrow. Thing. Spear. <laughs> Even college professors call them arrows. <laughs> Sensors in the target relay the force of a spear thrown by hand. Now the spear is thrown with an atlatl. The spear jolts the sensors. It plunges through the target into the wooden frame. <laughs> I got your wood. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I'd say he did. Yes, he sure did. So you can see the difference between just run with a hand 
arm versus uh, the at lateral. And uh, those are some of the, uh, they showed the, uh, the four shafts that you could have a bunch of and a little quiver and uh, versus uh, the main shaft. And uh, so that would be another technique or strategy that uh, once someone invented the, um, the at lateral, that in, uh, in, increased the survivor factor of, of the people doing the hunting and increased the, uh, the uh, terminal injury factor for the uh, animals being hunted. As I said before, it's a 200 times the force. And they actually have, this was a uh, contest down in Southern Maryland I went to about seven years ago. I just took some pictures of some of the kids. They, they pay 50 bucks to get in, and then the winner gets a $500 prize to who has the best target, who hits the target best with present-day um, flint nappers. With, uh, I'm not flint nappers, uh, um, at lateral users and spear throwers. So, and then, of course, there's different types of at lateral's that people can make. So, um, again, uh, there's that hand a scraper. I would think that Native American in their bag would have a, a side scraper and a thumb scraper. Thumb scraper, is, if something's really tight and you have to get it, you use a thumb scraper. And we found several of these at the Wallace site that I'll show you later, um, and also the uh, other scrapers. Another one I'm gonna pass around, I thought it was such a well-made uh, knife that I, I told the, uh, I met the, the person that made this and uh, I brought it to show you today. And I don't buy Native American artifacts but I will reward somebody present day flint nappers. Uh, it was worth $100 to me to be able to show people this is a present day flint napper using that stone, the, um, the brown banded jasper that was in this, uh, this box that went around to create a, a really nice, really sharp knife and attached it to a, uh, uh, an antler. Um, so pass that around if you'd care to take a look at that. If you have anything you need to cut, feel free. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, better, much better than the hand because, again, if you're pressing hard, especially if it's, if it's a flake, if it's a fairly sharp flake that hasn't been uh, controlled, uh, like this here, this edge has been softened. Um, has been abraded so that it won't cut you. Um, so you really have to be careful on, on the tools that, are, that you use, the, the stone lithic material, and how sharp it is. Of course, they were getting a variety of, uh, of uh, things out of the animal beside the meat and the hide. And um, like this particular bone that's also in, in, in uh, it's in buffalo, and, but, but it's also in deer. I know some of my students for project points, if, especially those that were hunters. But I had a couple of young ladies that said they would like to do it too. So I gave them a deer leg and said, I want you to extract this bone that's perfect for making a, into a needle. Um, there's two of them, one on either side of the deer leg and bison. Um, so, and you can also, in, in the knuckle joint, if you abrade it, you can create a, a fish hook. So there's a variety of things you can use to make out of the bone that's in the animal, uh, as well as the tail and, and uh, uh, they said, of course, they have rawhide, mentioned rawhide containers, but they can also use container, make containers out of the natural forest products, bark uh, and vines, a variety of different materials. So again, um, some interesting cognitive processes involved in uh, creating the artifacts and the whole system of going and, and, and uh, killing or hunting um, an animal. And then once it's killed to, to butcher it, uh, again, some techniques are, are important. And there was a lot of game in North America. Um, and one site that uh, I'm going to be uh, 
hope you have a quarter after one. I hope you don't mind being a little late uh, for your, your uh, afternoon nap or whatever, <laughs> or your afternoon run. But um, I went out to, I've always wanted to go to Head Smash in Buffalo Jump, although it's bison, but they call it Buffalo Jump. Um, the, um, in Alberta. Yeah. We flew into Alberta and then I drove down to Head Smash Jam. Of course, later after this, we went up to Banff and Jasper. Very nice, very pretty. But um, my wife said, So you really want to go to Head Smash? Uh, yeah, I want to go. Head Smashed in Buffalo Jump, Alberta, right there. And we're going to talk to you about why and, and the Blackfeet Indians that um, uh, named that site. And I was able to meet with the chief and one of the elders. Uh, I was much younger then. Had hair, but anyway, um, they talked about excavations over five cultural periods of six thousand years of uh, excavations of the, of, of the time period that they were able to excavate um, thirty-five feet down, and uh, one hundred and twenty-three thousand bison, basically, and all those archaeological excavations they yielded the, at least one hundred and twenty-three thousand bison. What's the point? To kill them? Yeah. Oh, okay. Not all at once. No. But, I mean, this is over thousands of years. Um, but their technique <laughs> was to, uh, once a year, I don't know, maybe once every two years, they would create a stampede, um, and then there would be people waiting down below to butcher, to process. I'll show you, give you all that. But um, yeah, run them off. And uh, we're talking about 1,700 pound animals, pretty large. And how do you get them to say, okay, get down there and okay, now jump off. <laughs> uh -huh. there's, a, there's a strategy, strategery. Um, so how do you get them from the gathering basin down to, yes, drop in. And the best time to do it is in the fall. The summer ruts over. The fall is a good time to hunt. They've got full coats for the winter. There's all kinds of things to process. And um, this is a 40-square-mile uh, area, so it's a huge area. And uh, these are called the drive lanes that, uh, over time. They took advantage of two things, their keen sense of smell and their poor eyesight of the bison. And what was done, and they started from their, when they're getting ready for this, this is weeks and weeks to get ready for the, uh, when they were going to be uh, uh, attempting to get them to make the big run. They would create these rock piles made of, st of brush and uh, stone. They're called cairns. And they would have up to 500 of them. Um, and this, we're talking about an eight mile area. And there were, over time, it would take them to build these cairns about, uh, about five, ten meters apart. And um, because of the poor eyesight, once they're scared and running, they don't see any gaps here. They see a solid line. Okay? They figured that out. The Native Americans figured that out. And they also made use of... Um, the hide, the buffalo, the robe of a bison calf, which they could smell. That sound seems friendly, no problem. Um, but they have other um, disguises of wolf that uh, buffalo would stay away from them and attack if they were attacked. So between the two of these, they're creating an environment that once the whistle's blown, <laughs> The, uh, the, the, uh, the runners, along with the, the wolves coming in from the side to scare the, the buffalo, the, the, one, the Indians dressed in the, the bison robe start running. They smell, oh, it's, and then they take off rather than scattering all over the place because it's a solid line and right to the cliff and over the cliff um, hundreds at a time. And the reason why it's called Head Smashed in Buffalo Jump 
It's not because the buffalo is jumping over, because the Indian legend has it that one of the uh, uh, one of the children was waiting down below to be help mom process, and one of the buffalo crushed her skull. So they called it head smashed in buffalo jump. But again, weeks, perhaps months after these kills, they're processing and making use of all kinds of of um, parts of the animal. Well, what use would they make of the uh, bison horns? The horns? On the bison horns. Um, let's see. What's it? Uh, I know we use them for, uh, uh, well, there you go. The horns, cups, spoons, ladles, and headdress. <laughs> I can read, but I didn't, I didn't really know. I, I was going to say we use them for, for work in stone. But uh, so I guess they could create a ladle out of it. Yes. I'm sorry. Did they? Oh, I don't know that. I don't know if that's wives' tale or not. Urban or suburban or rural legend. <laughs> I don't know. Yes. Oh, really? Heritage site this summer. Oh, really? We were hoping they were almost there. What's the name of that one? It was in the native language and was eight uh. syllables long, and I would have to look at it. <laughs> but they claimed that most of the bone was being sent to England because England was big on making bone china. Oh, oh really? And oh. they were sending with their ancestors. I would say that'd be, I was going to say that'd be much later to do that. Yeah. yeah. So I wonder if they sent this uh, this 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 mixture here of uh, called pemmican, um, where they would take uh, at, while they were processing, they'd take uh, lean meat, uh, beat it into strips, and then uh, mix it with dried berries and melted fat and formed into patties. So it's a nice protein. You know, I had my whey protein this morning with some strawberries. I guess pemmican is a pretty good mixture of protein as well. Um, so that's West Coast or close to the West Coast. And we're going to bring it back to the East Coast in the last 15 minutes and uh, talk about some more of what was going on on the East Coast um, or close to it. And you'll notice on this map, a lot of more paleo fluted points are found in the East than in the West. And... Um, uh, Dennis Stanford and, and Bruce Bradley have uh, their research. They believe that there was also another migration that came from Europe over, referred to the Salutrian, because some of the, the Clovis tools, there's a, a process in working that stone called the overshot method, where they would create flakes that would go across the whole projectile point that a lot of projectile points would used to be there'd be a, a line coming up the center but a lot of the the Clovis uh, use this overshot method that was also um, in the Salutrian tradition uh, 17 to 22,000 years ago in uh, southern France and Spain and um, their uh, hypothesis is maybe even though they didn't have a nice land bridge like the one out west, they could have walked around in boats and come across the Atlantic during the Ice Age. They found a, one of those overshot bifaces 40 miles off the Virginia Capes. Guys go fishing, and they bring up the fish, and in it was a bison, uh, a mastodon, uh, tusk and, and tooth, and also a biface. Uh, so again, that far back during the Ice Age, they were off the coast because there was no water there. Uh, so it is very possible that uh, there was also not only the Beringia uh, movement or migration at different periods, but also one that could have come from Spain, France, across, because the ice came pretty, pretty far down, at least parts of it, they, so they would be close to land and in boats to get across to the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And of course, from the East Coast, they can easily come around up Chesapeake Bay 
and uh, up to a site that uh, we've excavated here in Howard County on the uh, Patuxent River, um, the Wallace site. And uh, the Wallace site, uh, Mark just told me today they're still working on, they're lowering the, the level of Tridelphia Reservoir. Um, when I was able to work on it, um, they were working on the dam, they were lowering the water enough that when you couldn't see anything except water, all of a sudden there was this peninsula sticking out in the reservoir um, and it was loaded with Native American material. Oh, the biface is any, you take a core of stone and you take flakes off of both sides and thin it down to, to make a projectile point of some sort. So any projectile is a biface and it started with a larger piece of stone that was thinned down over time into a finished product. That's called a, it's been worked on both sides. Um, some bifaces weren't, no, they, they in fact, um, I just saw one out here in the collection. I, I think that sometimes they were, they had, they worked stone, they, they created bifaces, they had spares, and they would leave them at certain sites. They, caches, C-A-C-H-E-S, they would find, archaeologists have found them, so they would leave stuff there knowing they were coming back the next year. They would put it in the ground somewhere. Um, so they would have bifaces, so they wouldn't have to start from scratch. So they would take the stone, work them down, maybe five or six of them, say, I'll leave them there, get, get them next year. So, but a biface, basically, uh, if it's real big, you wouldn't be able to really haft it. Um, so it all depends um, on the size of it and the wear. But the, uh, the particular site I'm talking about, the Wallace site, is in this, this peninsula uh, that overlooked the... Uh, the Patuxent River. This is before the dam was built. Uh, Why are they lowering Tridelphia? At the time that we went in, they were working on some of the locks of the dam. Uh, they were repairing some. I'm not sure why they're lowering it. Uh, All silt. Uh, but uh, anyway, we were able to go in there uh, with, and, and that basically a 600 hundred thousand square foot area and one of my students Mark Wallace that's why it's called the Wallace he was more of a birder but he took my anthropology class <laughs> so he started looking up and he started looking down <laughs> he says, there's stuff here too go away bird <laughs> um, so I called it the Wallace site and uh, the, uh, we didn't know if we we're gonna be able to work there for more than six months or so because they said they're going to work on the dam and then they're going to fill it back up. So we actually measured uh, each artifact on the surface into the nearest tenth of a foot. Um, 1,300 of them. And then, of course, they didn't work the, the, the dam. They said it's going to be open for another year or two. They've got other work to do. So then we started, because there was so much material there, we started uh, doing a collect surface collection in 10 meter squares. Um, and luckily I had students that uh, love to do this rather than classroom work. Um, so my class was more hands-on anyway. So um, they, this was high school. Some of my college students got into it, um, but it was more high school because I was teaching there before uh, HCC. But, uh, so they would actually be writing the numbers on the artifacts. And uh, the, the interesting thing is that uh, we have, except for the Clovis point and, and Hardaway Dalton, we have every, every one of these artifacts has been found at the site, uh, except pottery. Um, we think it was a, they probably had pottery there, but it was a trading site. It was in and out, back and forth, I'll explain later. But we did find some characteristic artifacts um, that, um, uh, and the oldest of which would be this, this polymer point, this serrated blade uh, dated to about 11,000 years ago. Um, and at, made out of different materials from chert to quartz to rhyolite and uh, quartz again. And as I said, some actual arrowheads. And uh, 
Karen Federline, she actually became an archaeologist. I have a, four or five of my students became archaeologists, which is kind of nice. We were, so we were excavating in 10 foot squares and one of the members of the Upper Patuxent Archaeology Group was great at with computers and he took all the data and, and, he, and he made a, uh, uh, put together a, a nice uh, program to show the points that were found and the flakes that were found. And there's a commonality here. Mm -hmm. The points are made in it, they're working, there's two main areas where they're working stone. Maybe they're sitting on the edge looking at the water, watching the game down below or whatever, working stone. And uh, so we found flakes in the same area where we find uh, most of the projectile points. And uh, like I said, in, in core reduction, in order to get to that, you're starting with this and slowly working it down bifacially. You're working flakes off of both sides so it's thin. Um, there are some unifaces, but that's more in uh, certain uh, knives and scrapers. But uh, and as I showed you, I passed around the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, batons that were used to drive flakes off of stone. And the key thing about uh, knowing if you have a Native American site or if material, is it natural stone? Is it a geofact, natural, or is it an artifact? Especially when you're looking at this stuff, say, well, it looks like some piece of stone. What are you talking about? It's not an artifact. Well, these are flakes, different sizes. We would find if you know if they're working material from a big piece down to a small, flakes are going to work their way down in size. So as you can see here, this is one. This is a big flake, and we would measure them one mil, one millimeter, two millimeter, three, so so forth. And um, there's obviously bigger flakes here that you're going to find down here. And these are three of the uh, uh, rhyolite flakes that have that. Remember when uh, Bradley in that film was roughing the, up the edge, he was creating a platform that he was going to strike. You just don't hit the stone arbitrarily. So Native Americans knew they created a platform that they were going to strike. And uh, we had the advantage of uh, a friend of mine in, uh, in uh, Indiana at college. They actually wrote on flakes the, the key parts of them. So easier for people to understand. Um, so if you're taking, that's the platform that, that was created, that a person created. And if you turn that over, that's the uh, the ventral side of it. And that's a thick, if you took a, a BB gun and was shot into the, the uh, glass, there would be initial hole, and then you would see it radiate from that. So where it gets the most impact is going to be the bulb of percussion. It's going to be the thickest, and then it flows through it. So um, you can tell by looking on the dorsal or the ventral side of material if it's a geofact or not. And of course, if it has this bulb of percussion on the ventral side, then that you know that, that that's where it was struck and they were working stone at the site. And uh, that's why these, uh, these flakes have identifiable platforms as well as uh, bulbs of percussion. So this, uh, we found out that um, it was a processing station for over 10,000 years, and they were collecting material, because uh, most of the material, I'll get back to Bradley in a minute, 60% of the material was rhyolite, which is an igneous stone, and the closest is up in the Catoctin Mountains in Frederick. And one of the archaeologists in Maryland, he actually lived on a site where one of the rhyolite quarries was located. So they would basically working their way up um, to the to Howard County, what we call Howard County now, from the from the bay, uh, summertime, spring, summer in the bay, working their way up in fall and winter, hunting deer, collecting stone, bringing it back to the site, the Wallace site, working it, and then heading either north or, or south, depending on the, the time of year. This is a, believe it or not, this is a, uh, a drill and look at the the base of this drill is almost as big as long as the point itself so this was doing some major work uh work perhaps working into bone i'm uh, not sure but uh, you can tell by the base that they were creating um what they were doing with it and like i said 60 percent of the material 
at that site is, is uh, Rhyolite, and the closest is up in Catoctin. So they could bring it down from Monocacy to the Patuxent, portage across to the Patuxent, and come down, hang out there. And believe it or not, there are also sites in Pennsylvania using some of the same material as up, up near Harrisburg and Native American sites. So basically, it was part of a seasonal migration um, down to the south in the summer, uh, spring, summer, and then back up in the fall, and perhaps a trading station, because some of the material there is not indigenous to uh, Howard County. And we actually were able to put together a little exhibit talking about that period. We think most of the, this was at the end of the Ice Age. This was more the boreal period. So the game was a lot smaller. There wasn't that mega falling around, so 10, 11,000 years ago. And, uh, uh, yes? So the populations that entered uh, North America from the West, are there any estimates of how long it took them to make it to the East Coast? Hmm. Well, it's interesting. I can answer that, but in a, in a <laughs> I didn't mention that some of the sites, in, there's a site, Monteverde, in South America, in Chile, that's 17,000 years old. So we have Native Americans in the Western, in South America, 17,000 years ago. We have them in 11, 13,000 years ago, the Clovis points. Um, there were people here, and how long does it take? <laughs> I mean, think about it. Just today, if you drove from Alaska across to Maryland, how long is it going to take you there? Uh, so I'm thinking thousands of years, but who knows? Yeah. Pardon? Nova. Nova. There was a show just this week about prehistoric footprints found in New Mexico. New Mexico? Near White Sand. In White Sand. Uh-huh. What was the date? And they predate previous stories. Uh huh. People coming down from by about five to ten thousand years ago. So were they larger than seventeen thousand? Older than seventeen thousand? Said it were like twenty-five. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, that might be the Oscilla, they, they yeah. Oscilla state, yeah. Uh-huh. And they trace an adult child uh -huh. being followed by a giant sloth. By, by a giant sloth. <laughs> right. For like three quarters of a mile. Uh-huh. Wow, that's interesting. I mean, all kinds of stories in our historic past. What I'm going to do before I get to the, to the um, uh, if you want to see the dead of Stanford, I just mentioned that they were also some of the artifacts we found at the uh, at the Wallace site, um, and there was also you know we fished there today. They probably had fishing weirs where they were uh, catching catching fish, and some of the tools we found there were more for skinning uh, fish. Um, so there were a variety of artifacts, and I know that uh, Helen Roundtree has written about uh, different hunting and, and uh, methods that the, the Powhatan chieftain used, and that filters the Algonquin in, into Maryland as well, from the trapping, stalking, how you get a, a team together, uh, how you use camouflage, uh, fire hunting, where you run the animals out of the woods into the river and you're out there in a boat. Uh, I don't think they had too much of that but there is evidence of it, and there's definitely evidence that Native Americans were making use of fishing out at uh, the Wallace site and using artifacts like that uh, to skin the, the fish. Or, and one of my students, we, my, and I took my son and daughter out there when I was doing some archaeology back in the, in the early 80s, um, still a lot of fish there, <laughs> as, as they found. So depending on where you are, coast to coast, there's lots of... Uh, uh, evidence of uh, Native American adaptive strategies and uh, whether it's uh, uh, the end of the Ice Age. Um, 
and the beginning of a smaller game like deer as the ice age ended uh, around 11,000 years ago. And of course the artifacts are changing. The, the first uh, arrowhead was supposedly around uh, 1,000 to 1,200 years ago that they've had arrowheads. So we go back from some of the larger uh, tools in, in uh, closer to the paleo time up to the, uh, the artifact projectiles of uh, more closer to uh, uh, the contact period with Europeans. Um, didn't find any pottery at that site, but there are, I'm sure, other sites in the county where they might find some pottery. And I always like to end on this, you know, because uh, maybe I have. You know, maybe I have. Now, I do have a video clip, for those of you who would like to see it, of Bruce Bradley at an older age, maybe about 15 years ago, taking a flake and making a projectile in about, I'll speed it up, but it took him about 20 minutes to make it. Um, and that's the, that's the last piece before you go to sleep again. <laughs> so I'll show you that. And uh, <laughs> I had too much time during COVID to do all this stuff. Too much free time. You mentioned Mattapani. The Mattapani or Mattaponi. And yeah. the third slide back, you listed on there. What has happened to that house? Mattapani. The Mattapani Reservation or the Mattapani? Yeah. I heard it was for sale. Oh, I don't know. Oh, okay. The Mattap I don't I don't know about that. Uh, wait a minute. Uh oh. See, ever since I put him on there, I can't get him off. Okay. This is uh, how to make a stone tool in t 20 minutes, and I'll cut down to 10. When I finish, before I even start. By looking at it and seeing where it's curved and where it's thick. Yeah, i got to stop and preface that with, Native Americans were just picking up stone and working it and seeing what happened. They had an idea of what they were wanted to create, and that's what he's showing here. Etc. And knowing what kind of a form I want to make, I should be able to predict not only the, the shape, but the size as well. I'm going to predict that I will make a spear point. First of all, the style is predetermined, as I indicated earlier, by what I'm used to making. So I am going to make a spear point that will look like this. And this flake is quite thick, or this tool is quite thick and a bit curved right now. Not only will the point look like this, but it should be fairly thin as well. To do this, I'm going to have to remove a lot of flakes in the right sequence in the right order and, and from the right places. So I end up with that form, but I also end up with, with it thin. So now this is a process that I have to concentrate on. In the meantime, as I do this, I want to make more of these useful flakes. Now this is obsidian he's using, working. The next and he's starting out with a hammer stone. So, Pardon? That scraper is gone now. It's no longer oh. uh, a useful <laughs> scraping tool. And Watch why he has that leather on his lap. I need to you don't want to do that on a bare leg. The edges and the surfaces. To thin this down without losing the size. And at the same time, allowing me to make that shape that I drew there. That's the platform he's creating. And there nice, is. usable flake. Now you can actually pick up a flake like that and cut 
meet with it, but to remove at the risk of cutting your own self, like you were saying, here. Pat. <laughs> See that thick area he has to get rid of uh, without breaking it. Pretty thick area here. This is where I've got to be very, very careful because this material, is, as it gets thinner and thinner, it becomes easier and easier to break across the middle. Mm. All I have to do is hit it wrong one time now, and I'll not be able to make that large spear point that I had in mind. Still getting some nice usable flakes. We removed a lot of the thickness. It's fairly flat now. It's still got a little bit of curvature in it. And it's starting to take its form. This will be the tip here, to the base here. And now I've got to remove flakes that are going to drive right across that surface and flatten it out quite nicely without removing too much of the edge. Because if I get too narrow, then I'll lose that form that I'm after. So this is where I start preparing it quite well. And then shifting over to the antler again, where I can strike from fairly sharp edges and remove flakes that run fairly well across the surface. So I do a lot of edge preparation like this, even with the antler. There's a flake that came all the way across. All the way across. That overshot. One side to the other and really flatten that surface out. There's another one. Get down towards the end here. And I'm just about to the to the end stage. See it's gotten flatter. It's now not curved at all. It's much thinner. <laughs> and it's taken on the shape that I had in mind. Now to finish these edges here, this this would work all right. But I'd like to get it a little sharper and a little straighter so that it has a better chance of, of working even better. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm now going to transfer What's that? Antler from tine. the large antler to the deer antler tine. And instead of striking the material using the percussion flaking, I'm now going to actually remove flakes by pressing against the edge with this antler and remove small, thin flakes. Now, small doesn't mean that they, they won't go all the way across the surface. How far they go, I can determine by how I push the flakes. So now I'm going to take and hold the biface, the blank, in my hand like this, in my left hand. And I'm going to put some leather protection. Now I'm going to take this antler tine and remove small flakes. Now, right now, I'm just preparing the edge to actually remove the flakes from across the surface. So it's another and platform he's creating, and it'll push on that. Place the antler tine right against that edge, and then push inward, and then change the angle downward. And it's going to remove a, a flake from the surface here. And that one, that flake went all the way to the middle. Now, how far the flake goes is going to depend on what angle I use and how hard I press. And I don't want to press all the flakes all the way to the middle or all the way across. It just depends on what I need to do to the surface to make it regular. So that one I wanted a short flake, and I got a short flake because of the way I was pressing and the amount of force that I was using. Now this one I want to go a little bit further here, so I'm going to press inward a little more and a little harder. And went all the way to here. And I'm just going to continue doing this. So that each time there's I a method in the madness, place, right? I have in mind. Of course, that's the method of so I'm getting down to where he starts the uh, notches. Now this is where I've got to really concentrate because it's very easy to make a mistake here. And all I do is, is remove one major pressure flake, which leaves a fairly concave spot. And then I turn it over and rub the edge a little bit with the antler, remove, remove another pressure flake from the other side. 
takes another little bite out of the edge. And I just go back and forth doing this. I have to be very, very careful. Make sure that when a flake comes off, it leaves a sharp edge on the inside of that notch. That's called a quarter notch. Quarter notch the flake. angle will get too steep. And the same physics that were involved in making the very first flake will not allow it to be flaked any further. So there in just a few seconds is that now he's working the other side. We, it's now oh, as the shape, at least the shape is, that I thought I was intending to make. Uh, it's flat, fairly symmetrical, and notched at the corners. And that's the finish. Here is the, the, the drawing that I made of the flake that I started with here on the side and the point that I was intending to make, and here's the one that I actually produced. Good. See, it's a little longer a and a little narrower. Yeah. You get an A minus, it's a little long, isn't it? <laughs> B plus, A minus. <laughs> and the final finished projectile point. And of course, good flint nappers could, could actually... When I finish, um, before I even start. By whoops. looking at it and seeing Good flint nappers could uh, get away with minor uh, mistakes, but uh, and as as he showed, it it was a. Uh, um, in fact, my mentor Mac McDaniel from American University, he he said that there's certain artifacts he's found at the site down in Virginia that where those 800 flags were, that he thinks he could identify the Indian that made certain projectiles because of the way the bases were. Um, and obviously, as we present day have masters in different, uh, different arts, um, whether it's blowing glass or work in stone, um, some are better than others. But um, Is I, there status within the society for the guys who are really good nappers? I bet you. Because I mean, they're so important. I bet you the ladies like the napper. <laughs> he's a guy, he's a big napper. <laughs> he likes to sleep all day. <laughs> but anyway, that's, uh, I'm glad you're able to hang around. It's a little long, but I'm glad you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it.